Hello and welcome to Catching Up with Council. I'm your host, Dan Monroe. Joining me today, Ward 4 Councilwoman Deborah Gray. We're going to learn a lot about Ward 4, but first, I want to learn a lot about you, Councilwoman Gray. Thank you for joining me at the desk today. Thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. You're just kind of in your, uh, your first term as Councilwoman, but let's talk, let's go back a bit. Let me learn a little about yourself. Uh, where do you come from? Talk about how you got into the public service sector. Well, um... It wasn't planned, of course. Um, I and my twin sister uh, purchased a house in Ward 4 back in the late, uh, about 1989. And when we uh, became homeowners, uh, we uh, were told to go to the community center, you know, which was Buckeye Development Center at that time, you know, to learn, you, you know, to learn who our councilman uh, was at that time and to understand how we can get resources you know, from that center. So that's how we start engaging, going to the meetings, finding out, you know, what's going on in the community. And plus I had two sons, she had one, and they went to the schools in Ward 4. So we just started there from that point. And it just grew, uh, you know, from me, uh, you know, getting involved as a street club president, as a block club watcher. And then I ended up uh, joining uh, NLI, uh, which is Neighborhood Leadership Institute. I end up, um, I end up, uh, you know, becoming a precinct committee person over time, and I just continue to be engaged in uh, in all the meetings over the years. So with all that, it seems like through all that time, you kind of started developing what you, what the people of Ward Four need, the challenges they face. You almost had your finger on the pulse of Ward Four. Uh, you know what? Uh, I think I. Th I think it came up to be that because once I started seeing, uh, you know, what was going on in Ward 4 uh, and started learning how to understand how to uh, uh, engage with, uh, you know, with the development, I had a lot of good supporters at that time. I had a Van Gleer Neal, he was a street club president, Bob Render, um, Virginia, um, I can't remember her last name, Steve Barber. You know, we were all street club president at that time around in Ward 4. So we were like boots on the ground and we really continued to stay engaged on understanding how to work with the council, you know, with the funding. And then from that point, I ended up becoming a, um, an ambassador for Burton Bell Carr. I was on St. Louis Foundation Rack Committee Board. And then it just spiraled for me to understand how to apply what I learned to the constituents so they can understand what those entities were to do in our community. And that's how I start understanding how to use the resources for the constituents in the community and then how to build from that also with the merchants. So what brought you then to run for the council seat of Ward 4? Was this just a natural progression? Uh, what, were, what was that point that said, you know what, I'm gonna move on to run for council? Well, um, that was, that was, uh, uh, wasn't planned either. Maybe, you know, you know, maybe it was planned in God's eye. I'm not sure. But however, uh, you know, as time went on and we start having, you know, you know, the difficult problems that, you know, that, well, you know, that Ward 4 inquired over time. Um, I wasn't looking to run. Uh, I was looking to seek for someone else to run. And I wanted to uh, I wanted to actually uh, support someone else in this position because I was uh, because I had since retired early and I was just enjoying my retirement time because I also worked for, um, you know, the Cleveland Public Library as well, as well as working for St. Louis Foundation, Burton Bell Carbon Ambassador and also Cleveland Votes. So my 
you know, so my plate was full just enjoying that and still engaging in the community. So uh, when the, um, you know, so when, so when this position opened up as to run for council, I was really looking for someone else to be in this position. And I, I, I went back and asked really my son, his name is King of Gray, cause he ran years ago. And I asked him to come back and run, but he had just got a promotion on his job and he was traveling. So he said if he couldn't give his 100%, he couldn't do it. So uh, quite a few other uh, uh, residents who had decided to run had, um, I had had a conversation with at least five of them uh, who had considered and I had a meaningful conversation, but due to that, um, it's, um, it was a lot of considering who will be able to uh, um, move forward. So I still hadn't decided to run, but I had so many uh, residents, so many um, uh, professional people, so many officials in uh, uh, certain positions had called up and said, uh, Miss Gray, we would like for you to run. You know, we think you can do it, you know, with your background and what you have already done over the years without even thinking about it. You know, you have already been doing the work. You know, won't you consider it? And I was like, let me <laughs> give some time because, you know, um, I had retired, like I said, and I was comfortable in, you know, uh, and where I was at that time. So after I seen the uh, great support around me, then I said, okay, I will uh, take that initiative. And I uh, decided to go ahead and uh, uh, pull the petition. But I pulled the petition blind just to see the time and energy that it would take to go around the entire Ward 4 to talk to other people who wasn't aware of me mm -hmm. and what I have already done. So that's your time that you got to put in is to uh, actually sit and have that long conversation for people to understand uh, your passion, your belief, and what you're able to apply to them to move forward. And so when I uh, took that time to do that, and a lot of people started believing in me before I even uh, turned my petition in, that's when I decided to do it for the people in uh, uh, Ward 4. You ran, you got elected, you're now in your first term. Was it everything you expected, or were there more challenges you never thought of coming into this? Well, uh, it was more than I expected. And yes, it was more challenges that I didn't expect because I was basically boots on the ground. I was an activist and I activate uh, the problems that I was able to see in the community. But getting this position uh, was a huge challenge because I was never at the table, at a political table to understand what was going on inside the city and the council chambers. And that was the challenge that I had to face. Uh, it definitely wasn't a joke. So I knew what I had to do um, in the community. I was comfortable with that, but still learning how to connect uh, the council position and what, and what need to be communicated from council to the constituents was a challenging because you had to understand the language. And the language was the most challenging part for me to pull that together. Because if you trying to be the council, and I am an activist, you have to be very careful of your wordings and how you communicate with your constituents once you understand the structure. Mm. And then you have to kind of uh, uh, turn everything around so they can understand the process to the procedure of the council position and also what and how things are, are, are worked through in this position to get things done in a different way. Because when you boots on the ground, you're a fighter. You don't care about process and procedure. You just want it done right then and there. But once I got in the seat, it was a whole different agenda to understand now I can get it done, but now I have to get it done this way and we can get it done. A whole new set of rules to learn, a whole new learning yeah. curve. Did you have any support coming in, maybe from other people on council or, or even your sister who was councilwoman prior? Yes, we had a lot of support. My twin sister and I, we have always supported each other 
to help each other uh, dealing with the constituents because we are for the people. But coming into council, I did have uh, quite a bit of support. Uh, Councilman President Blaine Griffin, I had known him when he was in his 20s, along with my son, along with uh, Conwell, along with uh, Cordell Stokes, along with um, Zach Reed. They were all the young councils back in the day working together in the community. And by me uh, 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 knowing Councilman President uh, uh, Griffin, he was a huge support to me personally and also as a friend. And then when I came council, also as a council. So he always said, my door is open. If you need anything, just you know, come, come to me and we have a conversation. Well, let's look a little closer at Ward 4 now. What, what makes up Ward 4? What are the neighborhoods of Ward 4? Well, the neighborhoods of Ward 4 is um, we have Woodland, we have uh, Buckeye, uh, we have um, Cleveland Shaker, and we have Mount Pleasant. What are some of the uh, challenges facing Ward 4 today that you're focused on? Well, some of the challenges, the, uh, you know, the number one challenge is housing. Hmm. That is uh, among this, abundance over everything. And I know that's nationwide, but uh, coming into this position, I already knew uh, quite a bit about housing, uh, per se, when I was a precinct committee person. Uh, I worked with uh, former counsel, Anita Gardner. She is the guru of housing, and she was a code enforcer as well at one time. So her and I worked together consistently uh, when we uh, were precinct members, and she's still a precinct member as well. And so she taught me a lot about housing. And so when I came into this position well, as a precinct person, I used to go up to housing and sit with the um, one of the inspectors to learn about how I can help homeowners, you know, with their um, housing and also deal with the landlords. But by me coming into this position, housing is uh, bigger than I even imagined, uh, uh, especially working with out of state landlords as well as local landlords that are not doing the job of keeping their tenants safe, you know, and in a healthy environment. Yeah, there's been a lot of talk about that, especially the, those apartment buildings that are in poor conditions even to live in, and all these out-of-state landlords. Didn't you even go to New York to confront a landlord? Yes, I did, uh, and that was, um, that was a big, huge step that I had decided to do because uh, not only what uh, you know, we were dealing with on Shaker Square, I have to deal with the entire ward. I have to keep everybody under one umbrella. But every uh, tenant is dealing with their landlord in a different capacity. So I don't put everybody in the same melting pot. So why, uh, you know, and I decided to go to New York uh, because of the uh, humongous situation those tenants was dealing with that I have never foreseen before because I dealt with most of the tenants in the Mount Pleasant area, in the Woodland area, in the Buckeye area. So when I came council, I was able to see what was really going on with the tenants in, on Shaker Square. So I just uh, decided uh, to uh, call them. I actually called them first and tried to get in touch with them three times for them to invite me to come to New York because I didn't just want to just fly in you know, not knowing, you know, not knowing what to expect. So I talked with uh, the, uh, the Charit Brothers secretary and, um, you know, and she was aware that I was coming, but they never respond for an invitation. So I just decided to get a ticket and just go. But I did bring someone with me who was there to assist because I didn't want to fly in in a situation not knowing you know what I was going to face. So I brought a young man, well, uh, he was my ex-EA, and was Ryan Cricky. He uh, flew in with me, and uh, they opened their doors up with, uh, with no problem. Got there, and, um, and the secretary met her in the lobby, and, uh, um, and the uh, head man, uh, you know, Joseph Cherif, he is the uh, CEO and president of, um, you know, of his corporation, but he is the head person over the buildings all over Cleveland and also in Richmond House. 
as you know, they got cited for that fire, um, for that fire, um, what, for, uh, I can't think of the word. Well, well, anyway, they got cited for another building in Richmond Heights that they own, per se. And then, uh, you know, once we got there, he did not invite me up. But when I left, the third owner of the buildings here in uh, Cleveland, he called me and he invited me to his building to have a conversation about the three buildings that they own on Shaker Square. So we went there and uh, I met four of the uh, partners because there's uh, because there's a lot of partners and each partners have a different set of buildings in different cities. And this particular partner owned the buildings here in, uh, uh, you know, on Shaker Square. And we sat and had a uh, um, good dialogue about why haven't they uh, taking care of the buildings, you know, once they acquired the buildings, because they acquired the buildings in November of 2021. Okay. You had two other owners prior to uh, them getting the buildings. So they bought into the code violations. So they are the ones now are getting hit with, uh, you know, uh, you know, hit with renovations and repairs. So uh, uh, they apologize for not being a better uh, 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 stewards of taking care of the buildings, which I uh, basically said that I'm not here for apology. Mm -hmm. I'm here for them to come to Cleveland, face the tenants and have a conversation with the tenants and let the tenants know why they have been neglected since they uh, bought into the buildings um, uh, of November 2021. So they agreed to, because they were already coming they already set the date to come to take care of the buildings, but they did not set the date to talk to the tenants. And I was like, there's no way that you're going to come here and ignore these tenants. And they live it in this, this, you know, they live it in this building with deplorable conditions. And since you bought into it, it's your responsibility to take care of that. So they agreed to do that. So when they came in, they had a meeting with a uh, council, uh, President Griffin, myself, Chief Griffin, and Director O'Toole. We had a, a meeting with, uh, uh, with uh, the owner, uh, Omar, and with his two property managers and with their attorney. So we talked with them an hour, two hours in President Blaine Griffin's office. And then that same evening at seven o'clock, they had the tenant meeting. So from that point on, they had agreement for them to come in and take care of that building, you know, renovate it, take care of all the code violations. But they also own two buildings across the street, 12,500 and 600. And they had to take care of those buildings, too. Now, those two buildings, you know, are not in much despair, but they still need a lot of renovations because these are old buildings on Shaker Square. But however, since that particular Landlord bought into the violations. It's your responsibility, you know, so there's no excuses for them to happen, uh, you know, for them not to do what they need to do. However, it just didn't work well because now, you know, uh, another now the city is back into for receivership because they went through a process of them going to court with the city because they filed a civil suit. Then they filed and then the owners filed a, a suit with the federal court. Then the federal court um, lifted the mandang uh, for them to, um, you know, for them to release the civil suit. But now the city of Cleveland turned around and got the, a suit back for them to file receivership. So it's a whole lot of other stuff going on that I'm not initially part of mm -hmm. that part, but I, you know, but I do stay abreast with what's going on. It seems like a never ending frustrating battle that could make anyone's head spin. It, it, and it's this, all about taking care of your constituents, your residents. It is, it is, but uh, uh, you know, you know, but dealing with Shaker Square, yeah. I have to deal with abundance of the other residents uh, in the other area of Ward 4, they're dealing with the same capacity of slum landlords. And just to see, you know, you know, just to see that overwhelming uh, despair of landlords who, who buy these properties and don't take care of the properties like they should, it's disheartening to 
our constituents. It's disheartening to the system uh, to understand how how uh, you know how can these landlords and these out of state uh, 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 landlords buy these properties and and be allowed to uh, to not take care of them. There's got to be a loophole somewhere because because so many pe people nationwide is dealing with this. And uh, uh, one person or many people alone can't figure this out without without amending or looking at the legislation to do some amendments to uh, help the tenants to live in a safe and better environment. And uh, uh, we have to look at that uh, more closely. And one thing I've learned that um, the city of Cleveland don't have a point of sale. And we all know what a point of sale is between a buyer and a seller. You cannot sell a property and tell the uh, inspector uh, go through all the violations in that property. And that doesn't happen here in Cleveland. I can't say if that uh, could be the only reason, but but to understand this type of housing system is really um, is really confusing uh, for me as a council because I don't have all the dots to understand how to uh, help in every way I possibly can. But uh, but no one can do it by himself. So everyone that's here helping us to. Um, to ensure that these tenants should be living in a safe and healthy environment is the most important thing right now. Well, I'm sure we haven't heard the last of your apartments and on all the good work going on with them, but okay, let's, <clears throat> let's take a look at Shaker Square as a whole. Um, Shaker Square as a whole is in need of repairs, is in need of fresh, fresh life with uh, restaurants and stores. Uh, mm -hmm. There's been a big conversation on that. Where does that stand? Well, right now, um, I, I, I uh, work with um, NPI, Neighborhood Progress Inc., uh, which is uh, have 90% of Shaker Square and Burden Barrel Car has 10%. So those are the new owners of Shaker Square. And I partake in meetings with them like once every two weeks. I mean, no, uh, like once every two months. We have update meetings and where that stands right now, I believe that they are on point. Um, you know, uh, once uh, once the funding passed, of course, last year, we got the funding out the way and then they became owners and then they have received their funding from all the funders who gave them that $17,500,000. That's the funding for repair. So that came into effect this year. So they have already started uh, the roofing. They are, uh, they are on Shaker Square taking care of all the roofing problems. And then the Tuck and Point, uh, they have already done the landscaping on Shaker Square. Um, and uh, they are working with the merchants who, uh, you, know, you know, who's still there uh, to, uh, to ensure that they're able to stay and what they want to do if they want to move forward. A lot of the merchants have already left who wasn't able to stay per se, but they do have two companies that they're working with. They have the uh, Cleveland Playhouse, who's the broker. They have Fast, who's the, uh, who's the uh, leasing uh, a company. So they are working together to, uh, to, to ensure we get the right tenant. We need long-term standability tenants who's gonna be there to invest in Shaker Square. You know, we don't want to do the same thing that had happened years ago that brought us to this point. So um, we are in a good space. I believe that right now we in the best space that we are in since uh, MPI and Burden Bell Car has taken over. And they are doing everything that they are doing right now to engage the merchants, to engage you know, to engage the uh, constituents. They have meetings with the merchants as well, you know, to understand their needs. But uh, at this point, at this point, they are on schedule of taking care of all the buildings with renovations and repairs, and they're doing it in layers because you got to do it right. Councilman, you know, Mayor Bibb has said that he's going to make the southeast side of Cleveland his top priority for, for renovation, development, uh, restorations. Um, what do you hope to see come out of this, of, of the mayor's vision and his project? Well, what I hope to see come out of it is, uh, is uh, a new, beautiful, 
beautification of the southeast side as well as the entire Ward 4. But since he's focused on the southeast side, you know, we had just uh, legislated his 50 million um, initiative, you know, transformational plan. We uh, pushed that forward on June 5th. We passed that $15 million through. And that, uh, a matter of fact, I have that in my newsletter. <laughs> that is my newsletter to show that uh, uh, Councilman Bishop and Joe Jones, we are the Southeast Side Councils and we work together with the planning team that we meet every two weeks. And that's with building housing, economic development, community development. We work with the CDC, uh, Union Miles. We work with Harvard Community and we work with a planning uh, and we work with a host of other other departments that we meet every two weeks to talk about our next step. You know how we going to integrate to help build the southeast side uh, to ensure that this plan is implemented the right way. And also to, um, you know, and also to engage the residents, because once we hear from them, we know how we can keep planning with the development plan. And also, and it is in my Ward 4 newsletter. It's on page three. And it, uh, and it had, uh, th and thank you, Joan, for this. And uh, um, it's in my newsletter to explain how some of that money will be, uh, um, you know, will beautify Ward 4 as well as Ward 3 and Ward, I mean, as well as Ward 2 and Ward 1. It's going to go into housing. It's going to go into the business. It's going to go in resurfacing the streets. It's going to go into landscaping because that's already happening right now. It's no waiting two or three years. We're doing everything that, uh, you know, uh, that we plan to do with that funding right now. And the residents are involved along the way. So I'm looking at uh, being positive. I'm not in here just to uh, uh, talk, talk, talk. Mm -hmm. I walk, 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 because I believe in boots on the ground. And I, um, and everything that I learn, I go out and tell the residents in my community meetings uh, every two weeks. It sounds like Ward 4 is on the right track moving forward. And it sounds like you're optimistic about the future of Ward 4. I am. I am because I've been in Ward 4 uh, since 1989, and when I moved in there, it was a pretty uh, decent uh, uh, ward, whereas, you know, whereas you can walk the streets, be comfortable. The security was there because we had the mini station. We had the police mini station right on the corner of our 116th and Buckeye at that time. And we had a lot of businesses on Buckeye and Kinsman and Union. So people are very optimistic that uh, that uh, that it will come back, but in a better way, not in the way that it had uh, 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 crumbled. I'm going to use the right word. <laughs> use the right word because it did. <laughs> it did. So, um, uh, but moving forward, um, I'm optimistic. Uh, a lot of the residents are because they see things are happening right now. Slowly but surely. We can't jump into the fire pan and get burnt. We have to take our time. We have to facilitate this information as well as possible. I still uh, kind of, you know, one of my challenges is language wise, but I'm getting better as explaining, but also the constituents uh, don't want to hear a lot of political jargon. And I try to stay away from that. I try to keep it simple, as clear as possible. Uh, I engage the residents to help me along with the process so we can all be on the same page. But I am uh, pretty much optimistic that this uh, funding that we allocated uh, with Mayor Bill to put on the southeast side to help rebuild and stabilize and uh, give us beautification for the southeast side as a whole. Yeah, Councilman, I think I know one of the biggest challenges facing council right now, right now, one of the biggest points of discussion is the rising crime, uh, the violence in our city. Um, your opinion, what can we do, what can you do, what can anyone do to help curb this violence? Oh boy. Is there an answer to this? You know what, uh, I think it is. We haven't found the uh, only one answer. I don't think it's the only one answer 
thing because we know it's nationwide, but we have to um, understand, we have to go out and be boots on the ground. We really, really do because um, a lot of our teams uh, haven't, have, uh, haven't gotten the right family structure. I'm a mother and, a, and also a grandparent. And I know what type of structure I was brought up uh, uh, from, from my grandparents and from my mother and, and me as a parent, how I raised my two boys and I have four grandkids. Uh, they have never had any problems, but they live in their best life. Uh, and a lot of kids around this world, you know, are living their best life. However, we have a lot of families uh, that haven't had that to understand that structure. So um, for me, I'm getting back into the game because I've been a, uh, a single, uh, uh, I've been a single parent for years. Because my my uh, my grown sons and my grown teenagers and my four grandkids they live in Virginia. So once you kind of uh, uh, raise your kids and get that freedom, you just go for yourself. So but now since I'm in this position, I have to reinvent who I was as a parent to understand what other parents need. And I have seen so many deaths, so many shootings since I become counsel. And to, you know, you know, and the realization for me to have one specific answer, there's none. Cause I have met so many uh, single mothers who have been, um, who haven't had the nourishing to understand how to raise their children. So I know uh, when I was on the safety meeting a couple of weeks ago, my, uh, my assessment, because I'm boots on the ground and I get called in every situation of somebody's situation and I am facing to see the realization of how uh, these mothers these single mothers with kids are struggling, and I now can understand that uh, one particular mother that I just met recently, she has five kids, and that's when the realization kind of hit me. Um, I was called because one of her child, uh, you, you know, one of her children was sitting in the middle of the street, and another parent called me due to that because it frightened her because she was the one that almost hit the child. So I went down there uh, to visit the mother and the mother came out, uh, she wasn't upset. She had great dialogue with me. I mean, just tremendous, compassionate dialogue with me. And she said, I have five children. I have uh, two children, one 12 and 13. She said, she don't know where they be every day. They just leave. So that tells you that when you find these kids, 12 and 13, uh, riding around in stolen cars, they out here doing something mischievous. Mm -hmm. You know, they getting in trouble because they don't know their way. But she also said, I have three little ones. And my youngest child, well, he was nine. She said he the one sits in the middle of the street all the time because he has autism. And she said that that's repeatedly councilwoman. But she said, I need help. And that's Tell you something, and that's when it hit me. She said, I need help. I don't know where to get the resources. But if you can help me to understand what I can do better to help my kids, and I don't want to be separated from my kids, because I was once, but I don't want to keep being separated from my kids, but I don't have the resources to understand what I need to do better. And that right there tells you there's a lot of mothers need to help, they reaching out for help. And so my position is, well, I'm going to get the right person in the right position with the right expertise to come to you so they can help you the right way. But I'm here for you. But what I did was uh, she said she was looking for her own home because she was living in a, a deplorable slum house. And it was deplorable. And the landlord is disgusting. But they gave me all that information mm -hmm. and I took it and I reported them to building housing. I called the health department, which uh, which uh, the uh, which the uh, building housing supervisor had already been to the house. So that particular house is already being investigated and by and plus she was on a voucher. And a lot of the young mothers 
who are dealing with the situation, their kids uh, are out in the street. So my suggestion, my only suggestion was that uh, when you arrest these young teens, go to that particular house and, uh, and sit down and have a conversation with that mother find the, a grandmother or the mother of that parent because we got to go deep. We can't save a child if we don't know what's going on in the household. And when we connect with that mother, we got to connect with that child's mother because that trickled down for them, you know, uh, for them to be living in disparity like that. But when that young mother said, I need your help, that just clicked right then to see how much more of these young parents need the help they need in our community. If one person asked, they probably represent another 20 more, if not more, behind her. Behind her. And, and that's so amazing they ask for help because a lot of times they don't. They don't. They don't. And so I think that's where the police, I know they understaff that it's humongous and that's nationwide too. And once uh, uh, the safety director, Mayor Bill, I think they have working some things out with other uh, entities that they bring it into the city of Cleveland, you know, you know, to take care of that. Once we build that capacity and that will connect with the other services, I think, I think in the long run, it's going to help with some type of plan that they have to put together with the council because uh, because um, it's overwhelming for all of us. And I wish that we all able to just jump in and help everybody. But uh, um, it's a start to know that uh, for me as a council, because I'm boots on the ground, that I'm now interacting with a lot of mothers who are now trusting me to talk to me about their situation where I am called. And I just reach out to certain entities that I can give them a start. Even, uh, even they asked to be a first time homeowner. They said, if I have my own home, that'd be something that uh, um, you know, that I couldn't foresee that I can ever get. So I work with uh, Habitat for Humanity that does that first time home buyers and they have a beautiful, excellent program. Mm -hmm. So I reach out to uh, Bob Whitley, he's the outreach manager and we have a conversation. I've been sending him a lot of names and he's been working with individual families, you know, uh, you know, single mothers to see how he can work with them in a program. So you got to have some type of connection to give everybody some type of hope to know that this program might work and if not we can get you another program because the programs are out here we don't have to keep talking mm -hmm. we don't have to keep talking the programs are out here so let's facilitate the pro let's facilitate the pro you know the programs that are out here instead of trying to create new programs that's going to prolong the system, let's deal with what we have right now to, um, to reinvent that program to see how we can help what's going on in today's world. Councilwoman, how can people get a hold of you? You have social media, you have phone, your phone number, anything? Yes, yes, I have, uh, I have Facebook. I have a new Facebook page that I just created. It's City Council, City Council Deborah Gray, Ward 4. You can go on my new Facebook page. You can see what's going on in the community. You can ask me questions. I put videos out there too. I have a website. Uh, as well, I have a council website. You can uh, go in and ask me a lot of questions because a lot of people do. Uh, you can reach me at my office, 664-4941. I have a city cell phone, which is 216-857-0562, uh, which my phone been ringing since eight o'clock this morning. <laughs> I was a tad late, but I was dealing with two incidents before I came uh, here this morning. But, uh, and I, listen, I'm out in the community boots on the ground. I'm out of community every day. I do find time to rest for sure because uh, I do get weary, I'll be honest. But however, I find time to rest throughout the day because we are recess for the summer. So I'm more in the community more so than in the office, but I can be reached 24 seven anytime I got voted in for the constituents. So I am not busy for, you know, too busy for them. I'm busy for them. And that's why they elected me in this position so I can do what I can to find a resolution. Because I tell everybody, I have no dog in no one's fight. 
I am, I am an, I am an unbiased councilwoman. I, I, I'm here to find the resolution, to find a solution, so we can all work together, so everyone can be happy. So that's my position as a councilwoman. Councilwoman Deborah Gray. She says boots on the ground, and she lives boots on the ground. I bet if we're looking at your closet, we find an endless supply of boots. And if one boot wore out, there'd be a fresh pair behind there. Councilwoman, thank you so much. I learned so much about you in Ward 4. Thank you for joining me today. And, and thank you for watching Catching Up With Council. And thank you for watching TV20 Cleveland. I'm Dan Monroe, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>